Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Ice. I'm director of the Center for the Arts and Society. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> Welcome especially to Sonali Pawa, who is visiting us from CMU's Tucker campus, where she's a lecturer in liberal and social sciences. After holding several prestigious postdoctoral fellowships in preceding years, as a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at UCLA and a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin. I'm going to read the English translation of that, that uh, fine institution. Um, uh, Sonali is a cultural anthropologist. Uh, she's worked extensively in Egypt, and she has spent a great deal of time there, especially working on uh, youth culture, theater, and arts programs. She has worked also as a culture, cultural journalist for Al Afran Weekly in Cairo. And so thanks to all of you for coming today. Thanks to Sonali Pawa and to the co-sponsors of this event, which includes CMU Qatar Northwestern University, Qatar, and Carnegie Mellon's Department of History. So the situation in Egypt is obviously one that's been on my mind a great deal, on all of your minds uh, a great deal. Uh, and my reaction, and perhaps yours, to, to Egypt uh, as, a, as somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about Egypt, tends to oscillate between what I would call uninformed pessimism and naive optimism. Uh, uninformed pessimism, uh, because I think there's a tendency to take it as natural or as a given that a country like, say, Tunisia or Egypt should be subject to despotic rule. Uh, that rulers like Mubarak, uh, like Hosni Mubarak, would be around as long as their lifespan permitted, uh, perhaps handing off eventually to another despot, typically a son, um, but preserving a system basically intact. Um, and that kind of uninformed pessimism, I think, uh, has been challenged by recent events, but so has, uh, and maybe what we're less uh, aware of is, is, is the perils of naive optimism as we observe these events. Um, and that, I would say, is the notion that this transnational mobilization may be understood simply in terms of the new media as a, quote, Facebook revolution, as it's been described, or a Twitter uh, revolution. And in so doing, um, I think there are some important aspects of this that we capture, but others that we miss. We confuse memes, namely the, uh, the new media, with motive, and perhaps mistake the beginning of something for an ending. Um, and this kind of perspective also belies the fact that while Hosni Mubarak and his political allies may be gone, of course, the military remains, along with a host of other entities and figures that, along with the upper echelons of the military, have long been, long been heavily invested in the kind of authoritarian system, the kind of crony capitalism that have characterized this regime, and so might have a deep stake in at least trying to maintain that system, even if under different management. Um, so, in short, much remains to be seen, much remains to be done. Uh, and so here today, as a means to trying to begin to understand all of this, or track it more, more insightfully, we have suddenly Pawa's visit, which um, I think has a great deal to offer all of us. It was interesting that in the last couple of weeks, I've had all kinds of congratulations from people. Wow, it's so great that you're responding to events in Egypt so quickly, uh, arranging a talk that's so uh, appropriate, so on target. Wow, that never happens. Uh, but of course, uh, this is entirely serendipitous. We've been uh, planning Sonali's visit for, I think, at least three months or four months even. Um, and this just happened to coincide with, with events in Egypt. Um, I was uh, impressed by Sonali's work. She's a PhD in cultural anthropology from Colum Columbia University. As I mentioned before, she studies youth culture in Cairo, particularly focused on performance, drama, and self-help, and the politics of performance in relationship to Egypt's gov governing neoliberal economic and political order. She has several forthcoming publications in estimable journals uh, with titles like Personalizing Development, Arts of Selfhood in Neoliberal Egypt, and Acting Up, Youth in the Politics of Performance in Egypt. And in fact, the talk she was initially planning to give today, uh, before everything sort of happened in Egypt, was going to be entitled Active Identity, Youth Theater, Drama Therapy, and Globalized Citizenship in Egypt. Um, but as, as events have transpired, we've been in touch, and every few days, the, you know, the, the subject has changed. Uh, she's completely transformed her talk now to not only to engage with her prior work and interests, but to relate them to the current situation, a situation that is, of course, very much still in process. Uh, for all of us, I think this fortuitous collision of Sonali's deep experience in Cairo and her interest in such topics as youth politics, performance, and neoliberalism makes her an ideal candidate to cure us, perhaps, of both our uninformed pessimism and naive optimism uh, moving us in the process, I hope, towards something like informed uh, hopefulness, or <laughs> informed <laughs> but cautious uh, 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 hopefulness. Uh, uh, her talk today is entitled, From Alienation to Revolution, Youth and the Performance of Citizenship in Egypt.
Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone, on a busy weekday. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, on the evening of February 7th, Twitter in Egypt was abuzz with anxiety about the delayed release of Wael Ghonem, who had disappeared 12, 12 days ago. The 30-year-old Egyptian worked in Dubai as a marketing executive for Google, and his arrest by secret police revealed that he was also a political activist. Both his employer and his activist friends brought pressure on the embattled Egyptian government to release him, and later that evening, Ghonem reappeared on Twitter, announced his freedom, and went on Egypt's prime late-night talk show. The weary young man revealed to the show's host, Monal Shazli, that he had been the anonymous administrator of the Facebook page calling for the protests, which snowballed into a revolution. The page, We Are All Khaled Said, was named after a young internet cafe owner from Alexandria, killed last June by police after he videotaped their corrupt practices. And now, Ghonem's own treatment at the hands of secret police galvanized not just young activists, but a nationwide television audience. How did he become an icon? While Ghonem did not act the part of a revolutionary, he began his interview with an earnest apology for the lives lost when street protesters clashed with central security police. Yet, as an everyman example of the industrious citizen by day and activist by night, Ghonem focused attention on identity politics in the broad Egyptian generation described as youth, who channeled alienation into alternative nationalism. These middle-class professionals, unemployed internet cafe dwellers, bloggers, dramatists, and teachers had come of age since the 1990s when Egypt's state institutions cut employment in a program of neoliberal privatization. Forced to cobble together part-time jobs and often unable to marry or live independently, many in this generation found their identity outside of professional roles. My talk today follows the paths of young Egyptians who used critical theater, personal development programs, and drama therapy to form characters representing their quests for identity. They used performance variously to dramatize, develop, and heal a fractured self. The performance genres that I will sample today stage different politics, including theater by leftist youth troops and self-help workshops for improving performance in a neoliberal economy. Yet I will argue that performance is a central aspect of these varied efforts at claiming identity through imaginative embodiment. Egyptian youth who used performance to stage difference from tropes of identity in an earlier generation did so not in order to disidentify with the idea of the citizen, but to generate new norms of citizenship. The figure of the youth in these performance genres typically embodied the struggles of a generation abandoned by state institutions and traced their paths of alternative social participation. Like Ronim, they pointed an accusing finger at a corrupt system that stymied their future, but in performing alternative scenarios and as-if roles, these youth did not pin their hopes for reform on the establishment in a conventional political sense. Instead, both activist and conformist youth looked to arts of the self, appropriating neoliberal ideologies of self-help, often against the grain, in order to rehearse acts of proper citizenship. I would like to share with you today two plays staged in 2004 by independent troops in Cairo on the topic of satellite television and globalization, scenes from self-help programs, and finally, a drama therapy workshop in which young professionals learned to stage psychological conflict. When I completed this research in 2009, the notion that alternative youth culture would culminate in a revolution was only a dream, albeit one dreamt widely. Indeed, the plot of the first play that I will discuss featured political demonstrations. Yet I will read the turn from youthful alienation to revolution, not as a historical progression, but as an iteration, offering some thoughts on the revolution as a uniquely successful performative event prefigured in earlier performances. The use of the suffering body to stage social contradictions and of theater to give alienation a social narrative eventually resonated from stage and studio to street and square. It is this recuperation of experience through performance that forms my analytic. 
So instead of seeing embodiment as the means of expressing what cannot be accommodated within discourse or speech, I will examine how embodied performance gives form to fragments of experience. In analyzing theater and therapy, I seek to trace then how many Egyptians transformed the category of youth to which their tenuous social adulthood consigned them into a trope for struggles for citizenship. So my first section is called Talking Back to the Screen. Khaled Asawi was a telev television producer by day and a socialist activist at heart. He was also the founder of one of Cairo's oldest independent theater troupes, established when he was a student at Cairo University's Faculty of Law. The troupe was named Haraka, meaning movement in both the embodied and the political sense. As the Haraka grew from a university troupe into a stalwart of the independent theater movement, launched in 1990, its plays shifted from expressionist drama to a popular political comedy. Nevertheless, Khalid said that directing and acting in his own plays, quote, belonged to my vision, in a way that his work as a television producer did not. Even as he was gaining recognition for his cinema roles, Khalid continued to devote himself to theater. Other Haraka troop members were also media professionals and television actors. Their loyalty to the critical theater of their university days reflected, in reverse, the attachment of younger dramatists who were unemployed. These youth, who graduated 10 years later, maintained their university troops and held on to their, the art that they loved as a haven from the pressures of a grim search for employment. Khered and his colleagues, meanwhile, made a living as media professionals, but gained little job satisfaction. For Khaled in particular, theatre provided a creative space for his political thought. As a card-carrying socialist, he had often organised strikes and demonstrations at the lawyers' and the actors' syndicates in Cairo. Most recently, he had participated with Haraka troop members in the massive anti-war protests in Cairo's universities and main squares that accompanied the invasion of Iraq in March 2003. It was at these protests, Khaled told me, that the idea for his 2004 play, Messing with the Mind, was born. The play was based on improvisation. Initially, Khalid and Sayed, his assistant, both producers at state-owned Nile Television, developed a script about the fabrications of Arab television in the satellite age, with the title, A Lab Fit de Mer, Messing with the Mind. Like many in the independent theater world, the Haraka dramatists were critical of Arab satellite television and the globalization represented by its advertisements for consumer goods on the one hand and its entertainment programming on the other. While music videos and satellite channels, such as the Saudi-owned Rotana, showed Arab youths engaging in luxurious courtships, many young Kyrenes struggled to find work and marry. Often they channeled their enforced leisure into making art. At the long cafeteria of Cairo's Hanegar Theatre, established by the Ministry of Culture in 1988, or the nearby outdoor cafe, groups of young men and women gathered at tables from the afternoon onward, talking over tea and cigarettes about ideas for plays. They were regularly visited by set and costume designers or theatre critics who also frequented these cafes. Often the discussion would centre on a translated play or a novel that one of the group wanted to adapt for the stage. But I never heard talk of adapting a play from the Arab dramatic literature. That was the job of state theatres like the National, the Avant-Garde and the Salam. The youth troops who considered the Hanegar their home usually felt alienated from the writings of older playwrights, however socially critical they had been. Their own generation's concerns were very different. And so they improvised upon contemporary social themes and adapted translated works to tell their stories in a fresh dramatic language. With the 2004 play Messing with the Mind, the Haraka troupe sought a wider audience for its work than its usual constituency of youth and artists. As popular sentiment against the Iraq war grew in Cairo, the troupe saw a particular opportunity for its style of political cabaret, al cabaret siyasi. Khaled's post-performance statement about the play emphasized that he was bringing new politics to this familiar genre. Quote, I called for the troupe to begin from the street, where at the first protest of the attack on Iraq, we raised up the emblem of the troop and gathered to go to the protest. Then we got together afterwards to discuss it. Emphasizing that the play grew out of the political conscience of troop members, Khalid went on to say that it was a labor of love, which the troop developed without knowing if it would ever be staged. They did find a producer. 
The head of the Hanegar Theatre, Dr. Khodawasfi, recognized she had a hit on her hands with the first anti Iraq war drama in Egypt, and she gave the troupe a large production budget and a rehearsal space, both of which were used to expand the play into a sizable ensemble drama. Nevertheless, Khalid drew upon his usual activist methods to advertise the play. At the Cairo International Book Fair, held in late January, troop members distributed flyers as if to a protest march. The flyers read, quote, We want to say no to American occupation, corruption, capitalist globalization, media fakery, and the Israeli occupation. So come and see the show and add your voice to ours, end quote. Framing attendance of the play as participation in political and economic protest, Khaled emphasized the performative force of live theater in contrast to the television productions which the play would critique. At the final dress rehearsal, attended by government censors, he sent out an invitation by text message and got about 100 acquaintances to attend so they could serve as witnesses to any demands for cuts. The ploy worked and the script was approved in full. At the play's opening, I waited outside the theater doors with a crowd that milled throughout the long cafeteria. And then a group of actors burst in, wearing the camouflage attire of US Marines and waving fake guns. They herded audience members into the hall with loudly barked orders, occasional shoves, and the menacing pop of air guns. This tactile assault brought home the, the war viscerally. And then it was made televisual. Cameras filmed our entry into the theater and projected it onto a giant onstage screen with background music. A producer on stage shouted instructions on when to applaud and how to behave, warning, don't forget, we're on the air. The performance space had been transformed into an Arab satellite television studio during the filming of a talk show. The play's audience was invited both to experience the wartime abjection of Iraqis and to become experientially aware of its own participation in the new trans-Arab media that conveyed both war and entertainment. The fictional talk show in this play, titled Wahishtuni, was hosted by a classic Egyptian television presenter with bleached blonde hair and a flirtatious manner. Madame Nadia was, however, a tyrant off-screen. The dramatic expose of Messing with the Mind was performed by alternating between the Arab world seen on television and its unsavory backstage, and Nadia was an icon of the deception indicated in the play's title. Quote, she's always hiding her age and pretends to be the opposite of everything she is, Khalid explained. She is the regime and the system, not just a symbol. Nadia's opposite number was an American general called Tom Fox, a guest on the current episode of the show. The director Khalid himself played the general with comic flair as a collage of stereotypes of Americans on television. He greeted the audience with a hip hop song about how much he loved Egypt, performing both an endearing naivete and macho body language. The banter between Nadia and Fox, emblems of the two regimes engaged in a strategic alliance, showed up the general's misunderstanding of Egypt. Fox, look Nadia, Arab youth are deep in my heart, fine youth. I ask myself, what do Arab youth want? What do they want? They want a bride, Arusa. Nadia, oh my goodness, so General Fox, if we say that the young Arab man does want a bride, what can Fox do? Fox, oh, Fox can do plenty. Moments later, Fox brings on what he understood to be an Arusa, apprehending the word by its other meaning, a doll. He presents a life-sized, low-priced mannequin as his answer to the crisis of marriage in Egypt due to unemployment. As pointed as the satire of the misguided American was, the critique of Egyptian youth caught in the spell of Arab satellite TV was sharper still. Madame Nadia's next guest is a college student named Ashraf, who professes to be a lifelong fan of the show. Ashraf studies business significantly, and his westernized accent and hipster necklace mark him as a youth of the neoliberal era. If this weren't enough, he vigorously repeats Nadia's homily on how youth must help themselves and not expect the government to be their mother. Ashraf's understanding of the new liberalism is comically twisted, and the questions of the talk show host reveal that he's in a relationship with a married woman. Nadia is horrified, wrestles him down, and covers his mouth. She may not be the mother of state, but she is quick to lay down the law. Ashraf's farcical story offers commentary on how the mainstream media in Egypt suppress the voices of youth, but it's also an unfolding drama of how an older generation led youth like him astray. Ashraf's immorality does not owe to satellite television, as we shall see, but is an inheritance from his father. In this era of participatory television, the talk show host's effort at censorship is thwarted as Ashraf's lover, Intasar, calls into the show with a scandalous revelation that he stole her money. 
But the next caller, Ashraf's father, defends his actions. In front of God Almighty, I attest and affirm that Ashraf is a model son, who thought not of himself, but of his needy family. I know about those 5,000 pounds that the sister is talking about. They're in my pocket just now. And then we find that Intasar was also following family tradition with her scandalous relationship. In an interview, she mentions that her mother was, quote, clever, ambitious, and father's only capital, end quote. A scene from her childhood plays out at the back, and we see her mother going to work as a prostitute with a Gulf Arab tourist visiting for the summer. And the mother is played by the same actress who does Madame Nadia. This audacious reference to a social phenomenon that had for years been an open secret links the supposed corruption of the nation's youth to a broader decline that is the consequence of economic globalization. Satellite television talk shows conveniently airbrush out such details, but later in the play, the reality of war bursts through its deceptions, dramatizing the abjection of the Arab nation between the, beneath the cheerful images on television screens. Messing with the Mind was a huge hit in Cairo and Alexandria, tapping into the zeitgeist and uniting theater critics in a rare consensus. Taking up the popular topic of the Iraq War, the troupe shifted the focus of its critique to social corruption within Egypt. The struggles of youth enacted in the play indexed larger conflicts and unresolved questions on how to be an ethical citizen when economic disparity intertwined with corruption of social norms. In the course of the three-hour dramatic narrative, Iraq became a trope for troubles closer to home. The carnivalesque encounter of Egyptian television presenters, starstruck youth, and American generals was significantly punctuated with choruses of protest songs that began with the ironic greeting, Good Morning Egypt. The next section is called Youth, Media, and a Third Space. In the rousing conclusion to Messing with the Mind, the Haraka troupe affirmed that theater was a trope for the kind of embodied political action that was needed to break through the deceptions of official media. But another play that opened in Cairo just a week later showed that the media worlds of Egyptian youth offered a third space for alternative kinds of embodied action. The Mabad troupe's play, Mother, I Want to Be a Millionaire, used a smaller theater to stage more intimate media worlds. The 33-year-old director, Ahmed al attar was a graduate of the American University in Cairo and of the Sorbonne, and since his trilingual networking had brought funding for the play from Euro European sources, primarily the Berliner Festspiele, he could afford to stage it without tickets and to experiment with avant-garde techniques less familiar to Egyptian theatergoers. Quote, it is a play about this generation, its hopes and concerns, Ahmed said. He created a psychological drama about youth immersed in televisual worlds by watching Arab talent contests like Superstar, which is like American Idol, and improvising on the characters of would-be pop idols performed there. Like Messing with the Mind, this play used an onstage screen to separate television reality from its embodied counterpart. However, its plot and its form both showed that youth did not just use media, they inhabited media worlds. Ahmed described Mother, I Want to Be a Millionaire as a play made like a film. It was set on a vertical stage, mimicking a screen, different parts of which were lit for each scene. Here, the world of the television contest dominated the story for several scenes until the protagonist appeared. He was the television-obsessed youth unable to perform, sitting silently with his dinner or repeating rote lessons at school while the singers peacocking on television could hope to realize their dreams. The contrast between television and the mundane lives of Egyptian youth is marked in this play by the use of colors, music, and contrasting verbal registers of infantile repetition, as in the school scene, and song. Yet these short scenes are as flat as a screen. They do not develop narratives, nor do their characters unfold. It is when Hassan begins a chat relationship with a woman in another part of the set that the play develops a temporal rhythm. They speak first on the phone, um, a listless conversation about their uneventful lives, but then Hassan acquires a fictitious avatar as if in an internet chat room. Excuse me a minute. Um, and his story begins to move forward. Do we have sound? Okay. 
so the woman's the woman is on top of the screen and he's below. Here we see Hassan assume the persona of the fairy tale hero Shatir Hassan in order to be a romantic hero. Just as the aspiring stars of the singing contest did things with words, he too uses the performative possibilities of media to do what he cannot do when acting as himself. This is among few dialogues in a play dominated by monologues. Hassan's online persona actively navigates a third social space between the talent contest and his dull life in a quest that echoes that of his avatar, the adventurous folk hero, Shatir Hassan. Eventually, this persona crumbles when his flirtatious interlocutor decides to stop playing the game and turns religious. The disconnect between Hassan's media persona and embodied self becomes especially visible in a scene of therapy where he passes a probe over his body to find out what's wrong with him. The figure of a disembodied hero playing multiple roles was somewhat ahead of its time, and the play ended with an explosion into madness. Hassan becomes delusional, believes he has won the talent contest, and goes out to deliver a victory performance that turns into an act of self-violence. Well, he's singing a song over here, if you get the sense from the subtitles. It's the same song that all the contestants were singing. Okay, so I'll give you the soundtrack. So here he becomes delusional and this leg of meat drops down. I'm talking about how he hates Egyptians and hates himself. Anyway, we'll let this run. Despite this cautionary ending, Mother I Want to Be a Millionaire was remarkable for locating performance within the media world's youth whose thwarted adult lives were otherwise isolated and dreary. Here, a depressed young man could cast aside the mechanical repetitions of school and home, escape the frustrations of watching a lucky few win on satellite television, and write his own story. He could perform in anticipation of a future, however illusory. Indeed, new media proved over the ensuing years to be a more effective third space for youth to act than the policed space of political demonstrations in which a committed few continued to venture. Taken together, these plays about satellite television by theatre troops minimally linked to state institutions can be seen as narratives of the alternative public sphere which independent cultural producers were seeking to create. Between the hierarchies and ideologies of state institutions and the consumer culture of Arab satellite television lay the ground of this urban youth culture. The dramatists who sought to establish themselves as cultural producers here emphasized their belonging in a generational community in a way that was uncommon for avant-garde dramatists in other contexts. They presented their performances as examples of authentic generational voices outside the manipulation of state and transnational media ideology. The fragments of television programming that formed the basis for these two plays were used to show that youth felt alienated from them. More at home in the theatre or on the internet, they rehearsed roles here that pointed to a future in which more habitable forms of identity would be realised. The next section <laughs> is called Neoliberalism and Self-Help. As media and economic globalisation proceeded apace, Young Egyptians also began to participate in programs that used the means of performance more functionally to inhabit roles in a changing economy. When I returned to Cairo in 2007, I found a number of dramatist friends working as self-help trainers at schools, NGOs and private cultural centres. They taught acting methods, including improvisation, to college graduates seeking professional skills, as well as to children whose middle-class parents wanted to improve their social skills. All of this occurred in a changing cultural landscape where the growing prominence of private cultural institutions and a broad movement for personal development at Tanmay al-Bashariya was bringing dominant notions of culture closer to those of education. The pedagogical use of theatre and self-help programmes thus echoed a wider trend in self-making as a creative exercise and the use of artistic techniques toward arts of the self in a neoliberal era marked by the retreat of state cultural and educational institutions. 
While independent theater troupes used performance to embody fissures in contemporary identity discourse, personal development programs drew on acting techniques toward rehearsing new norms in professional and social roles. The college students who attended these programs at Cairo's biggest youth um, cultural center, the Sakya Tasawi, known as the Sakya, dressed tidily and walked purposefully to the lecture halls with none of the lounging and chatting seen at the Hanegar. Youth culture was a less liminal concept, certainly, for these middle-class youth who sought to build qualifications and compete in the neoliberal job market. When I asked the 24-year-old editor of Sakya's magazine what made it a cultural magazine, she turned the question back at me. What is culture? Does it have to do only with the arts? There's also a strong relationship to society. We present you with information and knowledge." End quote. Thus, the paper Sakya, this magazine, specialized in articles on young role models, um, book-ended with opinion columns by the center's businessman founder, who, by the way, has just become the Minister of Culture. <laughs> In personal development workshops hosted at this cultural center, the pedagogical discourse of self-help took on performative dimensions as participants learned how to emulate role models. I transpose Homi Bhabha's concept, sorry, I transpose Homi Bhabha's concept of the pedagogical and performative poles of national identity formation to these workshops and show their conflation as performative pedagogy gained in popularity while public education failed to keep pace with the neoliberal economy. Self-help had become a culture, not simply a set of individual initiatives, and a host of aesthetic means, including performance, created its symbols. The Sakya's founder, Muhammad Asawi, was the son of a former minister of culture and the owner of an advertising agency. He named the center after his late father, while formulating a culturing mission at the Khif in a distinctively contemporary vein. Asawi used his advertising skills to create social campaigns with eye-catching posters and disseminate the center's cultural discourse through a high-quality magazine as well as an internet radio station. The performance schedule at the center exemplified Asawi's business-like policies. Theater troops and bands could rent a hall for a fee and a portion of the ticket sales rather than being selected by an artistic committee as at state theaters. This policy was widely derided by Cairo's arts intelligentsia, who considered the Sakya a second-rate institution. But it illuminated a crucial aspect of neoliberal culture in Cairo, that everyone could be a cultural producer. Arts of the self now bore a contentious and contingent relation with producers of the more traditional arts. Here at the Sakya, music and theater were part of the entertainment programming, while educational workshops were taught by self-help trainers and business people. Meanwhile, at schools, NGOs, and acting studios, dramatists offered courses in self-presentation and improvisation skills. I will examine the former programs and compare them with others using embodied techniques to ask how performance and pedagogy complemented each other as youth cultural programs began to focus on personal ethics. On a summer evening in 2009, I sat near the front of a lecture hall at the Sakya with about 100 young women, all in demure headscarves, while the men settled into chairs across the aisle. We were at a weekly meeting of the youth group Ma'an together, and unlike the informal gatherings usually implied by that term, this meeting was led by a lecturer in suit and tie who set up his laptop on stage. He began with a motivational speech for job-seeking youth. Quote, you can sit in a cafe and complain, or you can do something constructive. Moreover, he emphasized that work was a form of ethical social participation. Quote, I should ask myself, how can I help my nation and my religion, was another refrain. After an announcement for volunteers needed by the Islamic Social Service Organization Risala, the lecturer went on to drill the participants in GMAT questions for three rigorous hours. The Ma'an website listed brief bios of successful graduates and featured a fictional dialogue between a new member and a more seasoned one. Quote, I don't seem to have a goal in life or know how to define what I want, came the question. And the older member responded, quote, Seek your goal diligently and persistently, like our master Abraham. Man guides you one day a week. For the rest, you must go to other places to learn and gain experience. Man has no link to a particular specialization. You are the only person who can define your own goals. The motivational language with a religious overtone framed the group's mission as that of teaching youth ethical forms of identity. Crucially, such forms of identity depended not on professional achievements, but on personal abilities developed through training. 
the idea that rehearsal for professional roles traced a path to success was reiterated in another program at the Sakya called Work is Worship, Al Amel Ibeda. A lively corporate executive in her 40s called Reem led each session, which featured simulated encounters between job seeking youth and corporate employers or presentations by successful young professionals. Reem said that she elicited the concerns of participants and thought of ways to resolve them. In today's session, she responded to several young women who worried that multinational corporations would discriminate against them for wearing a headscarf by bringing in what she called a model from society who made an effort and succeeded. Lamia was a Muhaggaba English literature graduate who had taught herself about business through various internships and eventually got a permanent job at one of the companies, impressed by her eagerness to learn. This flesh and blood embodiment of an entrepreneurial young woman with a strong work ethic, in contrast to the rather abstract ideas of the Man website, brought together the abstract performance skills taught at personal development workshops and their efficacy, or the illocutionary and perlocutionary force of role models. Lamia had educated herself at every available opportunity, and she had succeeded in the corporate world without fitting the elite bilingual profile the dream represented. The diverse workshops of the self-help movement commonly called at Tanmiya al-Bashariya shared a faith in rehearsal as a productive activity, whether this meant volunteering, professional training, or improvisation workshops. Speakers at each of the youth programs used a positive language of embodiment, encouraging youth to rehearse and practice until they became what they sought to be. This language resonated with discourse on self-making within Egypt's Islamic piety movement, and also with the neoliberal discourse on education as investment that Michel Foucault has called a theory of human capital. Of course, personal development training was a highly speculative investment. Few youth who undertook it had any clear evidence of returns. Indeed, with so little certainty about professional futures in Egypt, all educational investments required a leap of faith. The training workshops taught youth self-reliance and spawned a variety of volunteer movements that echoed the work of Islamic social organizations, like the one you see here. Yet, these self-help workshops were person-centered in a way that gave little space to discussions of social conflict or differences in cultural capital. Those differences emerged in a theater program uh, for child laborers, which I discuss elsewhere. Thus, for middle-class Kyrene youth preparing for mainstream professional careers, there were few social avenues in which to articulate conflict. Psychotherapy provided one such avenue, consonant with the person-centered economic ideology. In this last section, I will look at drama therapy workshops and ask how the notion of conflict as a psychological process in neoliberal development discourse generated cultural forms in which performance remained a useful means of problematizing the embodiment of citizenship. This section is called Therapy Culture. The character of the depressive youth at a therapy session in the play Mother, I Want to Be a Millionaire brought a widely acknowledged phenomenon into the dramatic repertoire. The word depression, used often interchangeably with frustration, was regularly heard in conversations among those who spend their unemployed hours in cafes downtown or at arts venues. Increasingly, young professionals in Cairo also turned to therapeutic practices like yoga and courses in the arts. Tucked away in a leafy corner of the middle-class Cairo neighborhood Mohandasin, the actor's studio was a thriving venue for therapy through drama. From 6 to 9 each evening, the studio, founded by the film star Mahmoud Hameda, hosted classes in an eight-month acting program. Many of those who attended the program did not plan acting careers, however. They were journalists, office workers, and amateur actors who came to the studio between work and home. It's something I do for myself, one journalist told me. In this setting, unlike at the personal development workshops, people spoke of a weak self, in need of a safe haven. I argue that participants in the drama therapy workshops developed an alternative social discourse of personhood through group exercises in enacting this vulnerable self. In a darkened studio where soulful music formed an auditory background, they left behind their professional poise and performed relaxation exercises, group therapy, and dramatic scenes that staged particular emotions. The methodical reversal of self-making in the preparatory exercises marked the performances as expressions of an interior consciousness, and the very space of the studio signified something like an urban unconscious. Drama therapy contained within this interior space social conflicts that also played out in the theater. Yet, by using the embodied and narrative techniques of theater, 
the workshop also generated identifiable characters. Indeed, the actor's studio had hosted improvisations that turned into a successful film about youthful alienation, Aukat Farag, spare time. I'd like to share with you two scenes intended for therapy and analyze how these generated dramatic roles that were both therapeutic and symbolic of the vulnerable self. The 30-year-old instructor Sameh had been a longtime stage actor before turning to what he called psychodrama. I want to know you from the inside, he told the students. Even if you lie to yourself outside, it is forbidden to lie here. The first person whom you face here is yourself. You must feel. I am not concerned that you should be an artist. The actors began class by taking up the posture of ice statues that melt and stand up again. They followed instructions for vigorous group exercises meant to improve coordination and responsiveness. They learned to evoke affects by staring at a cell phone and imagining a conversation or speaking to an empty chair in a classic psychoanalytic exercise. Through a heightened consciousness of the body and renewed concentration on mundane objects, actors reformed emotions by refining sensitivity to affect. Sameh described the process to me as one of inhabiting one's life fully and honestly, even if it meant playing a role one didn't like. The structure of the class reflected this uh, trajectory from re relaxation to re-energization and inhabitation, but each participant in the workshop traced their own path through the techniques of effective re-embodiment. Marwa, a married chain-smoking journalist in her 30s, never skipped a day at the twice-weekly workshop. She began the course, she said, at a time when she was psychologically tense and confused. I felt I wasn't living normally either at work or at home, she told me. The course appealed to her as a way to, quote, make the personal dimension of my life clearer. Her straightforward acting style with few artistic flourishes made it clear that Marwa was acting for herself. But she did not see herself as inhabiting her life more fully. Quote, the workshop teaches you how to enter into a role and separate yourself from it, which is necessary in everyday life, she explained. It makes me more effective. In effect, Marwa was learning to separate her everyday performances of role from a deeper private self. In an advanced section of the workshop, a young father called Nether likewise used acting as a space apart from the routine of work at his father's clothing factory. He had acted for years in amateur plays at his church, often playing what he called negative characters, such as a prejudiced man in a play about AIDS. What he liked about theatre, he told me, was that you could live more than one character at a time. While Nether's own manner was soft-spoken and shy, his performances in the workshop showed a special interest in the lives of the mad. Here he built upon his background in church plays on social justice by learning to embody characters who were unable to live with their conscience. Nether skillfully played the distraught father of a rape victim and a bodyguard driven mad by having failed to prevent the assassination of a former president, Sadat. His affective investment in these roles clearly consisted of more than pleasure at escaping his own middle class life. They embodied in dramatic form his troubled conscience as a socially conscious Kyrene bourgeois and gave him dramatic characters with which to identify emotionally. So Nader had taken the idea of embodying a true self in the psychodrama curriculum to embody an alter ego that signified his troubled side. And inhabiting the body of this alter ego gave him a way of bringing unruly affects into the dialectics of drama. As this example among many shows, the use of psychodrama to engender therapeutic performances in the acting workshop also produced authentic renditions of the very opposite of a balanced self. Such negative dramatic characters were attractive to workshop members and indeed to viewers of several recent Egyptian films as focal points for discussing social dysfunction. In a neoliberal public sphere, permeated with discourse of self-making and entrepreneurial role models, dysfunction was similarly often individualized. I offer the example of these scenes from the psychodrama workshop to highlight an important aspect of the culture of neoliberalism in Egypt, that of negative cultural icons that invited affective identification, both in therapy and in cinema. So participants in the psychodrama workshop, we might say, channeled their own negative affects to constructing characters who were socially dysfunctional but psychologically comprehensible. We might see this as a process of counter-identification. Their anti-heroes stood for a broken sense of self, and held a peculiar allure for the respectable young professionals who represented their social opposite. While it was ironic that a therapeutic workshop intended to help working people achieve emotional balance generated such dark psychological drama, these did fit within the tradition of socially conscious theatre in Egypt. 
So I read these psychological dramas within wider generational politics of identity and see how the workshop gives narratives to intensely personal experiences that were both individually therapeutic and symbolic of a rising therapy culture which formed the visible underside of self-help and personal pedagogy in neoliberal Egypt. And to conclude with some thoughts on performance and citizenship. Pierre Bourdieu wrote in his landmark work Distinction that bourgeois youth were inclined to try on roles, experiment with fashion trends, and generally to perform ownership of cultural capital in anticipation of the social roles they would assume as adults. But what happens to youthful performance when social adulthood seems permanently out of reach? In what ways does experimental performance become a means of staging identity in more than transitional terms? The popularity of theatre as well as self-help performance among Kyrenes in their 20s and 30s revealed that rehearsal can become a means of embodied reflection on identity formation. For university students, unemployed graduates and young professionals who made performance an integral part of their lives, roles were often more satisfying than professional identities or thwarted attempts at marriage and financial independence. Instead of introducing themselves as business majors or law graduates, teachers or office workers, Many Kyrenes of this generation instead spoke proudly of their roles in plays and student films or drama workshops in which they participated. Performance gave them a perspective on their lives as absurdist comedies, self-help quests and psychological dramas. It also helped them narrate lives that did not fit within the conventional narrative of a career. I believe that performance also worked as a spatial metaphor of the embodied practices by which these youth created home-like spaces in the world. The theatre was itself such a home, hosting a community of similarly alienated people and fostering a common language. Meanwhile, personal development workshops were more nurturing versions, perhaps, of ineffective schools like that seen in the play Mother, I Want to Be a Millionaire. Embodied performance in each of these genres traced the outlines of more habitable stories and spaces. So I argued that the disidentificatory force of experimental performance, uh, as we usually think of it, takes a different path here, producing habitable dramas as alternatives to official myths of consumerist youth glued to satellite television and alienated from national concerns. In the context of an aging dictatorship, nepotistic distribution of economic opportunity and surveillance by the police state, embodied performance was a way for younger citizens to claim a space for their own history and their right to act. On January 25th, thousands of Kyrenes, young and old, including activists, unionized workers, students and professionals, took to the city's streets for an extraordinary demonstration of that right. The icon of the movement that started this revolution, Khaled Said, was a young middle-class Alexandrian whose death at the hands of police provided a visceral example of the fate that many in his generation feared. The Facebook page, which launched the initial calls for protest, mobilized his image to call for an embodied action that rehearsed political participation performatively. And soon, online networking combined with labor and activist organization to realize the mass movement that had seemed like a utopian dream. The path of the Egyptian revolution revealed how media and live networks were intertwined in producing spaces and models of participatory citizenship. Both served as sites for performative action, rehearsing in illocutionary form what an effective political critique would resemble. Live and mediated voices came together poignantly in a host of videos based on footage of the revolutionary street and shared on social media and YouTube. Um, I can give them to you. They don't tend to have websites. Uh, they tend to be very much um, locally based, and few of them travel, though the little clips that I showed were from a play that did actually travel. Um, it went to the Berliner Festspiele and traveled internationally. That's why it has subtitles, which is why I could share it with you, um, as well as super titles. Um, in general, these are very locally based productions, and when they're not, it's interesting to see how they adapt um, to, to a more foreign audience. So the second play, for example, is very visual in a way that the first play was very, very verbal, which is why I shared with you more the dialogue than the visuals of that one. Um, and yeah, the visuals begin to complement, of course, you know, make up for the lack of language comprehensibility when these translate. But unfortunately, there are no websites. Yeah. Go ahead. I had a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, 
The first is, I wonder if you could unpack first the category of youth. Because it seemed to me, in the reporting that we've received, yeah. um, there's an assumption that a category something like that in Egypt mm -hmm. is transposable mm -hmm. into what American audience might understand. Mm -hmm. And yet, in both the age inflection and the mm -hmm. class inflection, or whatever the Arabic term mm -hmm. might be, don't seem to mm -hmm. fit quite the well mm -hmm. the U.S. audience might expect. Right. So this a, yeah, this is actually a crucial question because what precisely these people were fighting against was being categorized as youth and often being dismissed as such for many years, right? So a, a playwright or a director under 50 would be called the young director, the young playwright. And what that essentially meant was that they lacked structural power. They could no longer get a job at a state theater and become a powerful director of a state theater um, because there, there simply were no more jobs at state theaters which had begun to cut their budgets. Um, and of course, there's, there were still, you know, there's a small nepotistic crowd still in charge of these state theatres. Well, I shouldn't speak for now, or uh, had been uh, until the last time I went, in charge of these state theatres, some of whom were the same age as these people, but still refer to them as youth. So, of course, that category has so many connotations which I could go into. Um, one of the recent amendments in the new constitutional, um, well, the new constitutional framework, not the new constitution itself, is that the president. Uh, should be no younger than 40. And this was after many negotiations where uh, someone like Mohammed al-Baradei, for example, said that I believe Egypt needs a president under 50. And this in itself was highly controversial. You know, how can we have an, a non-octogenarian as a president? So that the politics of youth here, of course, very much the politics of an, a gerontocracy, essentially, which is also plutocracy and all kinds of other ocracies and oligarchies, uh, which we could talk about. So would it be fair in some ways to say that a better approximate term would be the politics of a younger generation? Yeah, well, it seems like youth in this context yeah. mean people all the yeah. way up into their 40s. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so actually that's the term I use in my dissertation title, <laughs> absolutely. It is about generational politics, but of course youth over here, um, it, it, does, it is used very broadly. And I'm interested to see also how it is used, how people do appropriate that term and try to turn it into a positive in many ways as well, right? So, for example, all the, um, all the trade union workers, for example, who participate in the revolution still would commend the youth who led the revolution. And that's, of course, that's a complex term. It basically means the activists, not all of whom are young, um, but often youth and activists get, that get merged together in that term. So uh, how can we say, like, if the youth were responsible for such a major revolution in Egypt, so why when we say that the president should be less than 50 years old, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, it's, is it controversial? Because for so many years, uh, there had been older people as politicians. Um, Mubarak, of course, was is in his 80s. His inner circle was similarly aged. And, of course, the supposed new generation that he had in mind was his own son to take over. So, you know, it, it helps to be young if you're Gamal Mubarak or one of his cronies, but other than that, it was very much a gerontocracy, people clinging on to power, as often happens with oligarchies, uh, when power is highly centralized, people want to dole it out in little doses to those that are closest to them in this kind of crony capitalist um, feudal system. So yes, this was controversial because a lot of people still today, you know, the Army um, high, high Command Council, for instance, uh, has members who will say things like, oh, these youth don't have political experience when they have been organizing political events for 20 years, right? So that's, it's a very political, uh, of course, concept, but yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about the, the class dynamics of this kind of self-help um, um, sort of uh, alienation. Mm -hmm. In other words, it seems the group, the cohort that you're bringing that I talked about is very much urban and middle class. Mm -hmm. um, does this extend uh, to workers in other places, or in et etc.? Well, uh, my first answer would be yes, it is mostly urban and middle class, and I was fascinated by how diverse the urban middle class is in its politics, its attitude towards neoliberalism and towards activism. Um, but I did also study workshops, for example, at one um, NGO uh, in poorer part of town, uh, Darb al Ahmar, where on the one hand, the self-help trainers were training trainers. Um, in a certain way, in this very kind of ethical way, and the other hand, training these child workers 
um, in a very aesthetic style on how to behave, essentially. So the class differences really showed up there. I also studied a workshop in Minya, which is in the south of Egypt, at the Jesuits uh, School and Cultural Center, which kind of showed you kind of the, the metropolitan provincial dynamic of this movement. But in general, it's very much middle class. It's very much deracinated. I mean, what fascinated me was how aesthetics were so taken out of uh, self-help language. You know, it was you can be whoever you want to be. It doesn't matter what you look like, whether you wear a headscarf, et cetera, et cetera. It was very, very intentionally anti-class uh, aesthetic. Though, of course, it contains deeply within it a uh, class-based kind of thing. I just want to uh, ask you if you could say a little more, uh, which you did touch on, about why this Western reading of this revolution, the so-called new media or Facebook mm -hmm. revolution, it is so it's so wrong-headed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it does obviously seem wrong-headed. It seems way over-optimistic mm -hmm. in terms of what role the media could play in any such mm -hmm. event. But in, in a short kind of... Yeah. Catch-all right. phrase. How would you um, describe it? Well, that? it's it's the newest and the latest aspect of what has been going on for 20 years or more. Um, protests, of course, have been going on for a very long time. Back in the 70s, you had the bread riots uh, in 77 in Egypt. Even before that, you have very famous protest singers who are still in vogue today, like Sheikh Imam. Um, and such. So there's a long, long tradition of activism in Egypt and several of those who participated in this revolution uh, were old leftist activists who'd been imprisoned over the years for being activists and some of their children, Ala Abdel Fattah and Mona Saif, two of the major bloggers and tweeters of the revolution, were children of activists who had been imprisoned over the years. So I think the newest touch that this added was uh, a medium which was difficult to police. So, for example, Al Abdel Fattah uh, was one of those that set up a VPN server, which blocked, which went around censorship. So, even well before the internet went completely off, uh, for many years, activists were able to use that server in order to do whatever they wanted to do and not be shut down, because the server was located somewhere offshore, essentially. So, it is yeah, it's just the newest. It's one new thing uh, which they were able to do, which you could see if you wish as a tipping point. Um, if you use that language, or if you like that language, or you could see it as just the extending the edge of the activist space. But it was an important extension um, in many ways, um, and also an important means of networking um, in many ways. So yes, it's, of course it's not a Facebook revolution, but I don't think we should discount the way in which uh, media and embodied action worked together here to link different constituencies, essentially. So this Facebook page, we are all Khalid Saeed, um, there's one in English and one in Arabic, and they both contain updates from all kinds of constituencies, right? So there's all this aggregation, whether on Twitter or on Facebook, of you know protest at um, a union, and they're still going on now. Some of the major uh, protests still continuing in Egypt are the unions, essentially, all over the country, right? Say we have news of such and such workers' union in Mahalla, a major textile mill town, which has had. Um, uh, revolts for years, strikes for years, and they bring the aggregate that into the page so people can see what's happening nationwide rather than having this very local perspective on activism, which activists tend to have. Not yeah, yeah I, I, I was fascinated by your description of the ways in which um, your exploration of what performance does in, in the sense that, that there's a, and, and particularly the, the, the combination of a the therapeutic. I guess you call it language around performance and expectation of what performance does, whether in the context of theater or in the context of self-help or, or psychotherapy itself. To what extent do you see, in the context of what's been going on recently, a therapeutic language being applied also to what political action does? Mm. In other words, as an expectation for, for, for political performances. Mm. Um, That's exactly what I should study when I go back in May. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. I mean, I haven't been back since all of this got underway, but, but yeah, that's the, that would absolutely be the question to ask, I think, right? In what ways the scene is therapeutic? But people, just to give you, I mean, just initially, my initial impressions, people have been using a language of regaining dignity, right? That's the kind of basic language of the revolution, um, which goes very, I think, very much in with what they've been saying all along. But in terms of therapy, I think it's going to get interesting once they start having the trials of regime figures. So on the 5th of March, I believe, are the first set of major trials of the interior minister, Habib Al-Adli, and that's going to be a circus. So, so that, that could be a point at which to start that. That's also going to be a public performance in a way. So yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, this is also a question that probably your answer is I haven't been back yet. <laughs> but 
But I, I wonder if you have a sense out of the people that were involved in these different kinds of activity, from therapy to self-help to the uh, performance pieces, uh, how they actually related to what's been going on in the last few weeks. Or, yes. I mean, what were your guests be? Uh, well, I know a lot of them were going down to the protests every single day. I would turn on Al Jazeera and see some of my friends on screen every now and then. Khaled Asawi, who the first person whose play I discussed, has been an activist for years and years, and he's been all over the newspapers now um, with these protests. And he, he's an interesting figure because he's now become a big movie star since I did my research. And everyone recognizes him. And he goes down to the protests with an overgrown shaggy beard, kind of against his not quite matinee idol, but film star look. And now he's back to playing the activist, which is, which is interesting. And all of them have been participating. Um, the self-help self -help crowd? Ah, well, one of them, yeah, did not go, yeah, he did not go down to the protest. I guess, yeah, the, the self-help folks are a little more kind of bourgeois mainstream and might not put their lives on the line in the same way as in the early days of the protest. In the later days of the protest, just everyone was going down, I think, to participate. But yeah, that is, that is actually a distinction I noticed. Yeah. Pardon? 